So our, our last uh, speaker within this uh, mental health and well-being session is uh, someone who I've got a few of her papers parked on my hard drive here and never thought that the person, the electrons in here would end up kind of standing here uh, next to me. I only met her late yesterday afternoon and she's done nothing but take a piss out of my accent ever since, but I can plug, plug, yes, like that. And I quite like that, so um, so she's she's a good good bloke in my, my book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's right. So let's let's close this gig out with Associate Professor Felice Jacker talking about uh, the importance of diet and mental health. Thank you. And thanks heaps for inviting me. I'm so glad I came. <laughs> The New Zealanders and the Aussies, we just have this love-hate thing and we really like to hang it on each other's accent. <laughs> it's, right. yeah. <laughs> um, it's been great. I've, I've learned probably more uh, today than I will actually impart in terms of knowledge. It's been a, a wonderful conference and um, I'm really pleased that I was able to come. Uh, just a bit of a context. Um, I head up two societies. One is the International Society of Nutritional Psychiatry Research and the other is the Australian Alliance for the Prevention of Mental Disorders. So understanding that, you sort of see where I'm coming from. And obviously, nutritional psychiatry and prevention really overlap, and, and the potential is there for prevention, we think, with this new body of knowledge. But to put this into a, a context to start with, um, and of course, there's many things that I'm going to talk about here that uh, many people in this room will already know something about. So some bits I'll put more emphasis on and others I'll flip over because they've already been discussed or I assume knowledge. But this global obesity epidemic, which of course first manifested in the West but is now making itself known right across the developing economies as well, has been driven by the um, large-scale industrialisation and globalisation of the food industry. And the changes to our food systems have been really profound and they affect everybody. They don't just affect poor people or uneducated people. In Australia, for example, national and, and state-based surveys will tell us again and again that only about 10% of people, 10% of women, about 5% of men adhere to the national healthy eating guidelines. And they're pretty basic. That is the two fruit, five veg uh, sorts of guidelines. So everybody is affected um, and the reason I think you know when I first came into this area I thought why don't governments do more to rein in the activities of the food industry but these industries they are the biggest they're much bigger than the tobacco industry they're much bigger than any governments so I feel like uh, I feel now that we really need to take a far more grassroots approach to push back against them because I don't think we're going to get very far expecting policy makers to change things be that as it may, what we now know is that unhealthy diet is the leading contributor to mortality globally. So this is burden of disease data just published a couple of weeks ago in The Lancet. Uh, unhealthy diet and the associated high blood pressure kill more of us than anything else, so more than HIV or malaria or any of the infectious diseases. So we have unhealthy diet as the leading contributor to early death across the globe but what you might not know is that mental and substance use disorders account for the leading global burden of disability. Now, there's a lot of mortality that comes from that, but it's a bit hard to, to quantify simply because when you have mental disorder, it increases your risk for comorbid disease, and that's usually what's recorded as the cause of death. But um, there is certainly uh, mental disorder and a misnosology. This includes neurodevelopmental disorders. It doesn't include neurological disorders. So neurodegenerative uh, dementia etc they're in another category but of course they are increasing in prevalence and impact because of the the aging population globally now what has not been taken into account when people talk about the burden of mental disorders and the burden of unhealthy diet is that the two are linked and if we actually now proceed with the cognizance of the fact that there is a link we can start to see that even though we know, uh, according to the WHO, um, NCDs are largely arising from unhealthy diet, will cost the global community about $30 trillion by the years 2030. That hasn't taken into account the cost of mental disorder and neurodegenerative disorders and neurodevelopmental disorders that are likely also um, a function of unhealthy diet. So the costs of unhealthy diet 
massive as they are, are still being underestimated. So I'm going to take you for a flying visit over the diet mental health literature, which really only emerged um, at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010. So for my PhD, I led the first study to look at um, links between diet quality and common mental disorders in women. And actually, if we go back, you can see these uh, blue, blue section here. This is depressive disorders and this is anxiety disorders. So they're not called the common mental disorders for nothing. Um, and when I first came into psychiatry research, which was quite accidental, really, um, I didn't even start my PhD till I was 40. So I, I used to be an artist and then I decided that psychology was kind of interesting. And then I thought, I don't want to be a psychologist, no, but I really like statistics. So I just followed my nose and I came into psychiatry research and I thought, where's all the data about nutrition? You know, like the rest of medicine has known for a long time that nutrition is important to physical conditions. We know that physical conditions are highly comorbid with mental conditions, particularly the MCDs. Um, and we know, we're starting to understand that all these things about nutrition affect things that underpin depression, such as the immune system, brain plasticity, gene expression, the stress response system, etc. So where's the nutrition data? There wasn't any. There was a few really crap you know, supplement studies, a few people really obsessed with omega-3 fatty acids, which is still the case in my field, um, but really very focused on single nutrients, not looking at the whole of diet. And of course, it's, it's kind of pointless looking at single nutrients. We don't just eat supplements or, you know, single nutrients. We eat whole diets and the way that food uh, combine, there's something like 25,000 active ingredients in foods. And of course, they all interact in a very complex way that we can't even begin to map. So we need to be thinking about foods and capturing that um, quantitatively, quantitatively. So we did. And uh, since the be end of 2009, beginning of 2010, there's been um, a huge number of studies from around the world that have looked and seen and reported inverse relationships between measures of diet quality and both the prevalence of and the risk for depression in particular. Now, this is true across countries, across cultures, and across age groups. And that first bit is really important to understand because a healthy diet, of course, and this is the question, what comprises a healthy diet, it looks really different in different countries. So a Norwegian healthy diet, for example, there's lots of fish and there's potatoes and there's um, beautiful whole grain breads and yogurts and things like that. In Japan, it's seaweed and vegetables and fish and rice, etc. Australia, Spain, they all look different. But what they have at their heart is, of course, a higher intake of nutrient-dense foods. So plant foods, uh, good quality meats and fish, um, good quality grains in many cases. So all of these versions of healthy diets are associated with a reduced risk of depression, reduced prevalence of depression. What's also important to understand, though, is that there are independent relationships between intakes of unhealthy junk foods and ultra-processed foods and health outcomes that are quite independent of the intake of healthy foods. And, of course, unhealthy foods and unhealthy diets around the world look far more similar because they're coming from the same source, which is industry. But it's very important to understand that you get... Um, intakes of unhealthy foods are problematic no matter how much of the good stuff you're getting. And vice versa, even if you're not eating much junk and processed food, if you're not getting enough of the good stuff, that's also problematic. And we think they're probably working via overlapping, but maybe some independent pathways because we see these independent relationships over and over again. So now we've seen uh, across countries and cultures and age groups that there's an inverse association. These are observational data. They're derived from, you know, large population-based studies where we ask people about their diet, we ask people about their mental health, and, of course, we take into account things that could explain both. So things such as socioeconomic status and education and, and BMI and other health behaviours, whether people exercise, whether they smoke, those sorts of things. Over and over again, we see that these factors do not explain the relationships that we see. Similarly, we know that when people are depressed in particular, that can affect their appetite. For some people, they lose their appetite. For others, they become, they really crave sweet comfort foods because what we know from animal studies is those foods are actually comfort foods. They do drop the stress response. A bit like having a ciggy or drinking too much. 
the short-term impact might feel beneficial, but the long-term impact is noxious. That reverse causality doesn't explain the relationships that we see either. So these relationships exist, and uh, importantly, they also, um, oh, and here's some nice meta-analyses that just back this up. So towards the end of 2013, happily, the data had become extensive enough and the published literature uh, robust enough that we could see these nice meta-analyses being published. So this is one, and you can see the reduced odds ratio there for um, an increase in healthy diet being associated with reduced likelihood of depression. And um, we had Stephen give us a really nice a sort of a, a primer on what these <laughs> meta-analyses mean. But I really like this one as well, because it looks at level of adherence to a Mediterranean diet, which is one form of healthy diet that we know has a very strong evidence base and showed that it's associated with a reduced risk of depression as well as uh, stroke and cognitive decline. So that's basically saying the data are very consistent and they're robust enough for us to say that this, this association exists. Um, but importantly, it also exists in adolescents. Now, one of the key understandings with mental disorder is that half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14. And when it comes to the common mental disorders, the average age of onset for an anxiety disorder is about six. That's when it's first noted, diagnosed. And for uh, depression, it's very commonly around 13, around the onset of puberty, particularly for girls. And for many people, that will go on to become a chronic condition. So, of course, if you want to prevent, you need to be thinking about what are the modifiable risk factors? What are the risk factors in general, particularly for depression? Well, we know family history, of course, genetics plays probably the most important role. But then there's early life trauma and stress. Uh, there's, there's a whole host of things that we don't necessarily have that much control over. So identifying factors that are modifiable is a really key task. Um, and so now we're saying, and we've seen this again and again, and we've done a number of studies in adolescents with the WHO Collaborating Centre for Obesity Prevention, with the Mur Murdoch Children's Research Institute, etc., showing that uh, adolescents who have healthier diets are less likely to have depression. Those who have unhealthy junk processed food diets are more likely to have depression. But moreover, over time, if kids move towards an unhealthier diet, they're more likely to have depression. If they move towards a healthier diet, they're less likely. So the risk seems to change with the change in diet quality, which is an important understanding, particularly whilst we still lack data from intervention studies. But what I really wanted to know was, and again with this prevention hat on, going back to the start, what is the possible role of early life nutrition in modifying the risk for mental disorder um, across the lifespan? So thinking about DOHAD and the Barker hypothesis, we know that early life nutritional exposures, what happens in utero in the first few years of life, modifies the risk for NCD. Does it also modify the risk for mental disorder? I was fortunate enough to get funding from uh, the large NASAD Foundation in the US to go and look at this question and test this hypothesis in the largest cohort study in the world, which is in Norway. So the MOBA study has data from over 100,000 mother-child pairs. They're collected over time. We had access to um, data from about 23,000 mothers and their children. This is the paper that was published out of this. This was in JARCAP, which was good because this is the leading journal in paediatric research. Um, and as I said, we had data from more than 23,000 mothers and their children. We had data on mothers' diets during pregnancy. We had data on children's diets during the first few years of life. And then we looked at the trajectories of internalising and externalising, which are observable behavioural markers of mental health and uh, vulnerability to later mental health problems in children as a function of their exposure to these dietary patterns during pregnancy and in the first few years of life. And again, of course, taking into account all of these factors that could explain such relationships. And I won't go into huge amounts of detail, but I will give you the summary, which was that <coughs> the children whose mothers had higher intakes of junk and processed foods during pregnancy, quite independent of what the kids ate in the first few years of life and all of those other factors, consistently had higher levels of these externalising behaviours, so anger and aggression and tantrums, etc. But the kids' diets were also important. The kids who had uh, higher intakes of junk and processed foods had higher levels of internalising and externalising, internalising sadness, worry, crying, nightmares, etc. 
But independently, again, lower intakes of healthy food were also linked to higher levels of these behaviours. And it looked like the data suggested that over time it was actually not getting enough of the good stuff that was even more important than the unhealthy stuff. Now that's great, but that's just one study. Happily, this has now been replicated in two other gold standard cohort studies. So these are data from the Generation R study in the Netherlands. Again, they looked at mother's diets during pregnancy with two constructs. One was a measure of adherence to a Mediterranean diet, style dietary pattern, a healthful type of one. Uh, one was a, a measure of adherence to a traditional Dutch pattern, which in this case, high in saturated fat and uh, not particularly healthy. And both of those constructs were associated again with externalising in the children over the first few years of life. So low med diet and or high traditional Dutch dietary pattern. And now we have data from ALTPAC, which is probably the best characterised cohort study in the world. And uh, Ted Barker, who's at Oxford, has done some really nice modelling here. And what he's looked at is maternal diet during pregnancy and maternal mental health. We know that they're linked. So mums who are depressed during pregnancy, yes, their diet is worse. But even if we take that into account, we see that mum's diet during pregnancy is linked to both the mental health outcomes of the kids and uh, the kids' cognitive functioning at seven. And again, it's low levels of healthy food intake and independently high levels of unhealthy food intake. So that's three studies that have shown this now. So it's a very consistent finding. And of course, it's backed up by really extensive animal data. I'm just gonna show you a few data here that give you a snapshot, but um, suffice to say that this paradigm of unhealthy diet during pregnancy is one that is being studied a lot now. So basically you take the pregnant mouse or the rat or the non-human primate feed it a version of a junk food diet and have a look at uh, the parameters in offspring that are related to whatever your particular health condition of interest is. And in this case, what we see is that a junk food diet during pregnancy quite profoundly alters the methylation of the genes involved in the reward system in the brain. And we already know from some of the human studies that there seems to be this intergenerational transmission of obesity that's not just around the fact that the unhealthy foods are in, uh, available in the environment, but that the children of parents who eat more of these foods find them more addictive and more palatable because it interacts with the reward system in the brain. You get changes in the serotonergic system as well. You get this global hypomethylation, this reduced serotonergic tone and manifests increased anxiety, increased aggressive behaviours in the offspring. These data are from um, non-human primates. You get increases in sympathetic nervous system activity and this hyperactivity that's like an animal model of bipolar disorder and it persists across the lifespan. It's a programming thing. If you wean the offspring onto a high-fat diet, you get this upregulation and all the inflammatory and oxidative stress pathways, mitochondrial function. These are factors that we know are really critical in mental disorder genesis. So the animal data support this idea that what we get in the first few years of life are important to um, our risk for mental disorder. Now, again, just to put this into context, and I don't think these data are particularly unusual in the West, but these happen to be data from South Australia from a highly representative sample of three and four-year-old toddlers published in the MJA three years ago, and only 18% of them are getting enough dietary fibre, which in the context of the microbiota is important, but in general health, uh, it tells you something about the quality of their diets. Only about a third were getting enough of the long-chain omega-3 fatty acids that are so important for development, brain development. Nearly all of them were exceeding the recommended intake of saturated fat, and already nearly a third of them were overweight or obese. These kids are only three and four years old, so this just tells you about what their lifetime risk for disease is going to be like. And of course, this is the generation that's estimated or thought may have a shorter lifespan than their parents because of the impact of unhealthy diet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about prevention, uh, particularly given the fact that most of the data I've shown you thus far are from observational studies or animal studies. Okay, so there's been very few interventions thus far because we're really early on in this new field, it's only five or six years old. But there's been a couple of studies that suggest that if we improve diet, we might be able to prevent depression. So the first a lot of data come from PrettyMed, and some of you may know PrettyMed is the largest dietary intervention that's ever been mounted or attempted. 
Um, it's in Europe, and what they did was they recruited older adults who were at elevated risk for heart disease or heart uh, cardiac events, randomised to three different groups. The control condition was this low-fat dietary advice, the American Heart Association guidelines, and then there were two versions of a Mediterranean diet, one with extra virgin olive oil added and one with 30 grams a day of raw nuts. And the people in the trial were given lots of education and support plus some of the food products over quite a bit of time. And the primary outcome they were looking for were cardiovascular events. And what they had to do was stop the trial after a couple of years because it was so clear that those in the, the Mediterranean diet groups were at um, reduced risk of having a, a cardiac event. And that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. That was great. We're all very pleased to see this. But my girlfriend in Spain got hold of the depression data. Now, depression was one of the outcomes that they just happened to measure as a secondary outcome. The important point is that they were in no way statistically powered to look at prevention of depression. If you think that half of all mental disorders start before the age of 14, three quarters by the age of 24, you have to have very large sample sizes to be able to see new depression in people who've never had it before. And they didn't have enough people. They only had just under 4,000 people. Nonetheless, they did look at depression as an outcome of which group people were randomised to. And what they found was a very clear, almost statistically significant uh, prevention, particularly for those in the med diet with nuts. And you can see here that there's probably, if they had a larger sample size, it would have gone in the same direction. But for about half of the sample who actually had type 2 diabetes, it was clearly significant. And again, here trending. So even with that massively reduced statistical power, they still saw this uh, prevention of depression in people who were randomised to a Mediterranean diet, particularly with nuts, which of course high in antioxidants, etc. There was also another study that was an accidental study, which made me laugh a lot and apparently made the, um, the investigators really grumpy um, <laughs> because these, these people, um, Chip Reynolds, this guy here, he's a, he's a doyen of prevention research in, in um, depression. And like many people in the prevention space, he's just obsessed with CBT, all different varieties of CBT. So in this particular study, they wanted to test their particular brand of CBT uh, to prevent depression in older people who already have elevated symptoms of depression. So if you've got depressive symptoms, you're four and a half times more likely to go on and develop clinical depression over 12 months. So they wanted to test whether this form of CBT would actually prevent the clinical depression. And then they thought, well, we need a control condition that's kind of equivalent but psychologically inert. I know, why don't we give them dietary counselling? And being completely unaware of all the new literature in this area, and they were quite grumpy to find that it was just as effective, if not more effective, than the CBT. So it's, a, it's an accidental study. It wasn't set up to, to look at this, but it does suggest, again, that dietary counselling might help people to uh, prevent depression. And they did go on and publish it in the American Journal of Psychiatry, so they couldn't have been that upset about it. <laughs> so... What we want to know now, there's two lots of things we need to do. One is that we need to understand the pathways that mediate the relationship so that we can develop targeted interventions. And then, of course, we actually need to test interventions. So they're the two challenges now. Personally, I don't think we need any more epidemiological studies because it's already very clearly established that these relationships exist. Now we need to know how do they work and are they causal. So the, the prime candidates thus far, first and foremost, inflammation and oxidative stress. And I don't think I need to explain these concepts to the people in this room, but immune dysregulation, we know from the data, well, I'll talk about that in just a moment, uh, neurotrophins and brain plasticity, which I'll talk about in a moment, epigenetic parameters, which I won't talk about because I don't know anything about them, but I'm learning, and also the gut microbiota. Okay. So inflammation, we know that inflammation and increased oxidative stress accompanies mental disorder. So at least half of people with major depressive disorder will have elevated biomarkers of inflammation in their system. And oxidative stress, which of course leads to lipid peroxidation, and it's one of the reasons we think that we see low levels of omega-3 fatty acids often in the tissues of people with major depression. It's actually an effect rather than a cause necessarily. <laughs> 
Um, but there's evidence to suggest that there's um, a causal aspect that's a bi-directional uh, relationship so that the inflammatory, bi the inflammatory mediators actually prompt depression. So the knowledge of that comes from uh, animal studies when you administer um, endotoxin, which promotes a cytokine release, so you can induce depression, and I think there's some data in humans that suggests that as well. If you give interferon, which is an analogue of a pro-inflammatory cytokine, a lot of people will develop really severe major depressive disorder. Um, and these are some of the observational data. So these are, again, from our group. And we looked at levels of C-reactive protein as predictors of de novo major depressive disorder in women followed over time, and we saw a dose-response relationship. So the women who had high levels of systemic inflammation at baseline were much more likely over 10 years to develop a new major depressive disorder. And of course, there are many sources of inflammation and oxidative stress in the environment that are very common. So substance use, low vitamin D, obesity itself, stress, leaky gut, um, which Emily referred to, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment, allergic diseases, lack of sleep, lack of exercise, but of course, poor diet is a really key driver of immune function. So Western dietary patterns are associated with increased inflammation. Prudent, healthy dietary patterns are associated with reduced inflammation. If you intervene to improve diet, you can improve the inflammatory status of people. Um, so that's the concept, really, that the diet is working on risk for mental disorder via modulation of the immune system and oxidative stress levels. So that's, that's one pathway. Another is diet and brain plasticity. So many people have heard of BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's just one of the neurotrophins. But <clears throat> basically, it's like manure for the brain. So we've known for about 10 years now that there's a couple of areas in the brain that continues to grow new brain cells over the life course. And the, the key one there is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is central, we think, to learning and memory. We don't really know how, but it does seem to be central to learning and memory. Also very important in mental disorder. So people who are um, suffering from depression and not treated, their hippocampus is smaller. When they're successfully treated, it grows back again. And often it seems to be mediated by levels of these brain-derived neurotrophic factors, which prompt the growth of new neurons, prompt neurogenesis, also protect the brain cells that are already there. So in animal models, or looking at antidepressant medications, if you block the BDNF receptor, the antidepressants won't work. And one of the ways that we think that antidepressants do work is that they increase neurogenesis, they increase BDNF. They also reduce inflammation. So diet has a big impact on BDNF levels and hippocampal function. And we know this for many, many animal studies. Um, just as an example, chronic intake, but even shorter than four months, of high fat or high sugar diets increases oxidative stress, protein oxidation, neuroinflammation, and reduces BDNF in the hippocampus. Now, there are many, many studies that tell us this. You can see hippocampal dependent cognitive functioning uh, affected within one week in the animal models. And there's even this one nice study in humans, middle aged, healthy men who were sedentary, otherwise healthy, they were given a junk food diet for a week, and at the end of that week, they had impairments in cognitive functioning linked to the hippocampus. So we wanted to know, is this true in humans as well? So last year or the year before, we published this paper, we looked at data from this large cohort study in Australia, and we were very interested in this idea of residual confounding by socioeconomic status as the explanation for the diet mental health link, and we looked at that in great detail. And what we found was that in adults, older adults, dietary patterns predicted depression over time and it wasn't explained by SS, et cetera. But then I tweet that this um, particular study had data on MRI data, brain imaging on about 250 of the older people in this particular study. So we were able to look at dietary patterns against measures of hippocampal size and volume. And that's what we did. And this is what we found. And this was just published uh, a couple of weeks ago in BMC Med. And it's a pretty cool study. So the, the, the blue is the baseline measure, the hippocampal volume. The green is four years later. 
So that's the first bit that's really depressing. As you get older, your hippocampus shrinks just because you're getting older. That's a bit sad. But these are the predicted values of those with a poor diet, average diet, and good diet. And these are not insignificant differences. And in fact, diet quality um, accounted for about 60% of the average age-related decline in hippocampal volumes. So again, this is really concordant and taking into account things that could have affected that, such as depression, such as stress and a whole lot of other things. Um, so this is really telling us that what is true in animals appears to also be true in humans. And it gave rise to some really nice headlines that made me laugh a lot. But um, as I said to my colleague, this is not not true. <laughs> and I've often colloquially said, um, yeah, junk food rots your brain. So this is, I think, some evidence that this is true. Now, the gut microbiota, happily, Emily has introduced this very well. So I'll be able to um, go across this and you, it will be reinforcing what you've already learned and maybe um, coming at it from a slightly different angle. So 100 trillion microbes live on us. We're just covered in bugs. 90% of our cells are microbes and 99.5% of our genetic material is actually microbial. So when you think about all the money and time and attention that was paid to the Human Genome Project, and yes, it was very interesting and it described our genomes, but there's been precious few health findings come out of it. It hasn't actually resulted in much in the way of improved treatments or anything. And I think that's because most of us are not actually human. It's, it's <laughs> with, with bugs. So we need to be looking at the microbiome. And of course, the human microbiome project I'm far more interested in. The gut bacteria in particular, which is the largest reservoir of the, the microbiota in your body, uh, they seem to regulate metabolism and body weight, immune system function, and mood and behavior, as Emily has talked about. Um, and of course, they're highly influenced by age. So by the age of two or three, you get the stable enterotype. Up until that, it's largely malleable, it would seem. Geography, where you live in the world, is really going to have a big bearing on your enterotype. Stress. Stress changes microbiota really fast. A couple of years ago, I had a really stressful event that was related to the NH and MRC in Australia and funding. And almost overnight, I developed gum disease. And I went to the dentist and I said, why would I have gum disease? I floss. I'm really good with my oral hygiene. He said, are you stressed? And I said, yes, I'm very stressed. And he said, oh, well, that would be why, because it changes very fast. I'm very interested to know what the relationship is between the oral and the gut microbiota, because it might be a lot easier to get oral samples from people than stool samples, but that's another question. Um, medication use, of course, particularly antibiotics. Not just antibiotics, though. I mean, in psychiatry, one of the major issues is the use of antipsychotic medications, which can often be life-saving for people. They're necessary, but they make them get extremely fat and um, very unhealthy metabolically. And there's two studies now that I know of, possibly more since I last looked, that tell us that it's likely happening through the microbiota, that if you give a lanzapine to mice, changes their gut microbiota within hours, and that is transduced to changes in glucose regulation, insulin sensitivity, etc., within 24 hours towards a very obesogenic type gut microbiota. And of course, there's implications of all of the antibiotics in the food system. But diet, diet is key. Long-term diet um, is determined, uh, your enterotype is really determined by your long-term dietary patterns. But of course, you can also change your microbiota very quickly within hours by changing your diet. Now, this is the thing. When I came into psychiatry research and this whole idea of nutrition and mental health, I was very influenced by Lauren Cordain and the whole paleo thing. And this is before we knew about the microbiota and this idea that your genotype takes a very long time to change. You know, it made some sense. But now we know that microbiota, which is most of us, change within hours. And it's likely that uh, the microbiota really become optimised to your environment. And that's why someone you know, in the northern Greenland or in, um, northern Canada, can live happily and healthily on a diet of seal blubber, whereas we couldn't. If we went there, we would be sick pretty fast because their gut microbiota are, are quite happy with that. They've worked out how to do that. You know, the gut microbiota of people in Japan are optimised to break down seaweed, which is not the case with us. So it's um, when we think about traditional diets, no matter where they are, they are helpful probably not just because 
they're much higher in nutrients and lower in processed unhealthy foods, but also because our gut microbiota are optimised to those. But that's not to say that we can't change our gut microbiota and they do adapt to our environment uh, very readily. This concept of leaky gut is really important because we are starting to understand it's probably going to explain a lot of ill health that is related to diet and stress. So your gut barrier is like, supposed, it's highly active, it's highly uh, bioactive, but it's supposed to be largely impermeable because the stuff that's in your guts is supposed to stay in your guts. <coughs> but there's many things that appear, and we're finding more and more all the time, to open the tight junctions and allow the contents of the gut to spill out into the bloodstream. So these are gram-negative bacteria, undigested food products, toxins, etc. And they make their way into the blood and of course the body mounts an immune response and then you get this systemic inflammation. So it's called metabolic endotoxemia, but we just call it leaky gut. Uh, one of the things we know that induces leaky gut, and we see this over and over and over again in the animal studies, is a high-fat diet. So this is just one study. These are measures of bacterial DNA in the blood after one week and four weeks on a high-fat diet. And there are many data to tell us this. One of the problems in the field is that when they say high-fat diet, it could be anything. It could be lard, it could be um, cottonseed oil, it could be anything. So we're just about to, I'm going to start my first animal study, which is hilarious. I feel like I'm going to be like a real scientist and have a proton and, you know. But because I want to know, okay, there's likely to be differential impacts of different sorts of fats. So we're going to be looking at mice and we're going to be looking at olive oil versus coconut oil versus uh, soybean oil versus olive oil. And there's already data to show that they have quite different impacts on gut microbiota and metabolism, but we want to look at mood and behaviour as well. Because it's not enough to just say, well, we know a high-fat diet's bad. But then this also does talk about balance. You know, it's a high-fat diet. There is no evidence that I'm aware of that this is going to be a healthful thing. And there's a lot of evidence, certainly from the animal studies thus far, that it's not a good idea. Um, the other thing that induces endotoxemia that we know of is binge drinking. But there's probably other things as well that we'll increasingly find out about. This is a fascinating thing. This is from Mother Jones, which is a great website. Um, everyone's familiar with the obesity map of America. And this is the map of antibiotic prescription rates. And that's the correlation, 0.74. Now, of course, it could be that people who are obese have more of a need for antibiotics and they use them more. So we don't know the direction of that relationship, but I do think it's a very interesting one because, of course, antibiotics affect microbiota probably in a way that is obesogenic. Microbiota and mental health, happily Emily has prefaced this. We use these germ-free mice with no commensal bacteria. They have altered stress response, elevated stress hormones, altered levels of BDNF in the hippocampus. Some of this can be reversed if you actually give them bugs. We see altered gut microbiota in animal models of depression, of early life stress. We see in animals that probiotics can address some of the um, anxiety-like behaviours. This particular one, Lactobacillus rhamnosus, we've actually got, we've just found out that we didn't get a grant from the NHMRC uh, that we put in in collaboration with the group in Cork in Ireland, who are really the world leaders in gut-brain access research, to test this as a treatment for major depressive disorder. We didn't get it, but we're going to try again next year. Um, and if you swap, do mecal, uh, fecal transplants with mice, you can switch their behavioural phenotype and make anxious mice less anxious and vice versa. Same as being fat or not fat. So that's pretty uh, compelling. And of course, there's some early data that probiotics can be useful in ameliorating um, psychological distress and even changing um, brain activity in the area of the amygdala, which is the primary seat of emotional um, functioning in human. But these are all very early data. They're mainly done in healthy volunteers. We think that the gut microbiota is probably a key pathway that mediates environmental exposures such as poor diet, uh, stress, um, and some medications and other environmental exposures that we know are toxic for health, they do that via the gut microbiota. That's what we think, because the gut microbiota 
impact on the stress response system and brain plasticity and immune function and all of those other pathways that I discussed. And the really great thing about it is that we now have the tools to characterise the gut microbiota and, of course, target them. So the more information we have, the more likely it is that we can intervene. So this is where we are now because I'm interested in prevention and because I think early life is where we really need to um, focus our attention. What are the opportunities for early life prevention of mental disorder? So the key understanding with the gut microbiota, and I think this is out of everything the most important understanding, is that the early gut microbiota of the newborn drives brain development. And we know this from all the studies that have been done in germ-free mice. The gut microbiota determine the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, micro microglia function in the brain. They drive brain development. So theoretically, if you have a suboptimal gut profile of the newborn, you're going to get issues with brain development. The gut microbiota, of course, also run the innate immune system and help the body to develop that innate immune system. So the, the newborn gut in that first two or three years of life is really critical to what happens to the growth and development of children. This is what we understand from the animal work so far. Where do babies get their gut microbiota from? Well, they get it from their mums. They're exposed in utero, but then they're largely seeded on the way out from the mother's vaginal microflora. That is, of course, unless they're born by caesarean, which is unfortunately very common. The babies born by caesarean have a very different gut profile that's associated with an increased risk of obesity and possibly other outcomes. What affects the vaginal ecosystem? Well, it's the same sorts of things that affect the gut and the oral microbiota. So body composition, diet, infection, antibiotic treatment and stress. And of course, during pregnancy, it is not uncommon for women to be given antibiotics prophylactically uh, and for other conditions. Mothers of children with autism were found to have greater frequency and severity of vaginal bacterial infections during pregnancy. And of course, stress during pregnancy alters the vaginal host immunity and the bacterial composition. So all of those things, diet and stress and being overweight and medication use, they affect the vaginal microflora as well as the gut microflora. So we need to figure out how we can optimise the, the vaginal microflora so that the baby gets the best dose on the way out. This is a really interesting study. It's very preliminary, it's, it's underpowered, but nonetheless, um, this was just, just published. Uh, this was an RCT in 75 <coughs> newborns. They were randomised to get either Alvaminosis GG, which is a, a, a bacteria that's commonly in yogurts and things like that, versus placebo. And they were looking to see if it could avert allergic disease, eczema, etc. These kids have been followed up now for 13 years. And what they've found is that at the age of 13, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or autism spectrum disorder was diagnosed in 17% of the children, the placebo group and none in the probiotic group. So now, as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of effort going into trying to characterise what an optimal gut microbiota might look like in the newborn so that we can prophylactically administer these probiotics. It makes a lot of sense. It's a very low risk thing to do. Um, one of the nice things is that there's probably things that we can do to mitigate uh, negative impacts on microflora in the newborn. So this is an animal study just published showing that N3 fatty acids can reverse the impact of early life stress on the gut microbiota. And of course, breastfeeding seems to be quite helpful as well. This is a really key study that really speaks to the same thing. So this is Elaine Hazau, she's at Caltech. They develop very nice animal model of autism spectrum disorder. And what they do in the pregnant dam is they um, promote an immune response, which we know is linked to the risk for autism and also schizophrenia. And then the offspring have the phenotype of autism spectrum disorder. They have the leaky gut. They also have the behavioural characteristics, stereotypic and repetitive behaviours. They were able to reverse nearly the entire phenotype by administering this bacteroides fragilis. So again, it's saying we might be able to intervene right at the start to prevent ill health. And this is a really exciting potential. 
So a couple of years ago, I was asked to write this editorial, and I don't know much about schizophrenia, but when I started looking at the literature, some of the diet-related parameters were important, so gestational diabetes, for example, vitamin D status, um, and, of course, immune activation during pregnancy, which may uh, be a function of immune status, which, of course, is influenced by diet. Can we then take these very broad public health approaches to improving diet in mothers with a potential benefit uh, for offspring if we want to prevent mental disorder? It's really hard getting mothers to, to improve their diets. In Australia, most mothers do not adhere to the, to the pregnancy guidelines. We know that. And in fact, their data to suggest that their diets actually get worse over the course of their pregnancy. But we think that maybe by taking a very targeted, gut-focused approach, we might get some traction. So this is a pilot study. We're just starting with a PhD student collaboration with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute <coughs> and the Elementary Pharmabiotic Centre in Cork in Ireland. And women coming into their third trimester will either get a dietary workshop and support and, and education or control condition, which I won't go into now because I'm running out of time, to improve their diets during that last trimester of pregnancy. The idea being that we're going to try and improve their microbiota before the baby comes out. And then what we'll be looking at is feasibility. Can we get women to improve their diet by taking this targeted approach? But then do we see a difference between the groups on the mother's and the children's microbiota and the metabolites, such as the short-chain fatty acids? Do we see changes in epigenetic parameters? Do we see differences in inflammatory biomarkers? And do we see differences in, in stress? So, And we'll also, of course, look at a whole range of uh, correlations and things. So that's the first step. I mean, there's many studies I could talk about that, that we're doing or that we're planning to do. But this one I'm really interested in. Can we just take this public health approach and try to influence the maternal environment, it may benefit mum's health, it may benefit the children's health going forward. So when the study was published in the American Journal, there was a very nice um, Marlene Freeman, who's also at Harvard, did a very nice editorial. And I think it's true now that this is starting to, to come to, to pass. By compelling and daunting to consider that dietary intervention at an individual or population level could reduce rates of psychiatric disorders. So that's where we're heading. This is really important, and I think it's a bit of a no-brainer for the people in this room, but you just can't take a whole bunch of supplements and continue to do this and expect it to all turn out okay. They're just not equivalent. There are very few data. When people have a major psychiatric condition, you get this increased inflammation, you get sequestration of nutrients, you get lipid peroxidation, so then they can really benefit from supplementation. But at this point, there's no evidence to suggest that it's going to be beneficial as a prophylaxis at the community level. We need to be eating properly. Oh, two minutes really fast. I chucked this in here because I knew that some of you paleo people would be interested in this. When I did my PhD, I, I was brought up as a vegetarian. I never ate meat until I was in my 20s, I don't think. And really, I didn't eat much meat both of my life. And then I, when I did my PhD, one of the hypotheses I had was that animal proteins would be noxious to mental health. But actually, what we found was far more interesting and actually was that the strongest relationship between any dietary component and mental health was around red meat. In this case, Australian beef and lamb, which is very good quality grass-fed stuff. We know that in the US, red meat is a baddie, but we think that it's probably residual confounding that's explaining that because people eat a lot of red meat, they also smoke, they don't exercise, that sort of thing. There's two studies that suggest that vegetarians or low meat eaters have poorer mental health than those who don't eat, that, that do eat meat. But the direction of that relationship is unclear because it can be linked to neuroticism, which is also linked to increased risk for depression. Uh, so we wanted to have a look at this and... Um, you know, taking into account overall diet quality because, of course, people who eat more meat may be eating more junk food, but they also might be eating more vegetables and good stuff. So we need to take that into account. So what we did was we categorised the women according to the NHMRC recommended guidelines, which are the three or four small palm-sized servings of red meat per week. And then we looked at women who were either less than that. We took out the 20 or so vegetarians just to make it cleaner or more than that. And... Um, so they were the, the figures according to the NHMRC recommended guidelines. And taking into account, as I said, age and diet quality, we found this. So these are women who were in the recommended category. We held them as reference. And women who had either less than or more than the recommended intakes 
were twice as likely to have a major depressive disorder or a dysthymic disorder. They were twice as likely to have an anxiety disorder of any sort. And they were all also more likely to have bipolar disorder. So if it was just one disorder, we call it a statistical fluke. But this was really consistent. This is when we looked at GHQ12 scores, which are a measure of symptomatology, and it was more J-shaped. So this was the problematic end, those who had less. Now, anecdotally, what we hear in clinical practice is that young women who, who come in, they have severe depression and they're vegetarian. We're very interested in zinc, in vitamin B, and a whole range of things, iron, that it all can be found in meat. And it really talks to this need for balance and the fact that probably it's really essential for our mental as well as physical health. So needless to say, I'm not a vegetarian. <laughs> 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 We're also running the very first RCT of dietary improvement as a treatment strategy in major depressive disorder. We literally got our last assessment yesterday and we're going to start the data analysis next week. It's incredibly exciting. It's had a lot of media because it's the first intervention that's actually going, okay, let's test this hypothesis. If you're already depressed and you improve your diet, are you going to feel better? So we're using a modified Mediterranean diet. So it's a Mediterranean diet, but with the recommended intake of red meat because traditional med diet's quite low in red meat. Uh, this is just a plug for the ICNPR. At this point, membership is free. We'd really love to see any of you who are interested in this. Just sign up. There's the Facebook page there too for information, but just get in touch with me and we'll put you on the membership list. Um, we had our viewpoint published in Lancet Psychiatry earlier this year, and I'm enormously proud of this because when I first started on this, my whole point, well, actually, there was two points. One of them was to prove that I was right. Um, <laughs> the other was to get nutrition moved, to change the paradigm. In psychiatry, where we have always looked at mind and body as separate and not looking holistically, just targeting people's heads, we know now depression is a whole body disorder. You cannot disentangle physical health and mental health. We have to treat the whole person. We need to put... Nutrition, physical exercise, smoking cessation as centre pillars of our approach to treatment and to prevention. We've just had a consensus statement published in World Psychiatry, which is the third leading journal in psychiatry research. And we've just now, for the first time this year, the US Dietary Guidelines for Americans Committee, they make recommendations to the US government about the dietary guidelines, have included uh, mental health outcomes uh, for the first time. And I'm told that that was largely based on a lot of the work that we've done, so I was very pleased about that. So it's starting to make itself known. And the fact that this is a field that's only six years old and we've come from absolutely nothing to now, this is extremely exciting and satisfying and I really do get to say I told you so a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fantastic. Thank you.